Welcome to the 2013 Denver School Board Debates, presented by A Plus Denver. This November, voters will make important decisions that will impact kids for the next four years. Hear directly from the candidates about their plans to elevate education on the public agenda. And good evening and welcome to the 2013 School Board Debates presented by A Plus Denver along with partners Education News and Fox 31 Denver. We want to thank you and thanks for joining us this evening as we talk to the candidates. Tonight we have the candidates vying for the District 3 board seat that's in central Denver and those candidates are Mike Johnson and Meg Shump. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you. For those of you who aren't quite aware of A-plus Denver, it's an advocacy organization with a mission to harness the power of Denver's civic leadership to build public will and advocate for the changes necessary to dramatically increase student achievement in public education in Denver. Uh, we're going to start, we're going to have an informal hour-long discussion here tonight. I'll give you some uh, idea of the amount of time we want to spend on each topic. We're going to spend about 10 minutes on this first topic and you're each going to answer one question. So let's start with maybe about two minute answers on this first question, then we'll ask some follow up questions. Um, in the two minutes, describe uh, what you would do to accelerate or change the direction of Denver Public Schools to increase achievement. Basically, is the district on the right track? And Meg, we had a little coin flip before we started, so Meg, we'll start with you for two minutes. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having us here tonight, both Ed News and Fox 31 and A Plus Colorado. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to people tonight and to inform them of some of the important issues affecting DPS. I believe that uh, DPS has been doing some great things when it comes to uh, providing early childhood education. There's been an increased emphasis on that and that has been wonderful for our district. Um, I think overall I'm concerned about some of the narrowing of our curriculum and some of the lack of engagement in our community. We've had several um, issues over the last year and a half that have come to a head because we did not involve the community early and often in the decisions that were going to impact their neighborhoods and, and their children's education. So I'd like to see the district move forward in increasing engagement. I'd like to see them increase uh, and broaden the curriculum to include arts, music, library, lang languages, physical education, and civics in our social studies uh, curriculum. Uh, I also think it's important for us to increase the accountability and transparency in the district. And um, I'll pause there and just thank you again for having me here tonight. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, Mike, you can take a shot at this one again. What would you do to accelerate or change the direction in DPS to uh, improve student achievement and outcomes? Um, thank you, Eli, and thank you, Ed News and A Plus and um, Fox 31, appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, I think this is a critically important question. This is really what the election is all about. I think that we have been making some positive improvements in Denver Public Schools in the last few years. They're not enough. We need to go a lot further. Um, we um, have increased our uh, achievement rate, but it needs to do much, much more than that. I believe very strongly in having strong neighborhood schools in every neighborhood. I believe that every parent should have a choice to send their child to the school that fits their child best. I think that's something critically important and something that um, Denver has done a, a good job of recently. I'd like to see more choice. Um, I think we made some important gains in, in funding in 2012 with 3A and 3B, which I was one of the leaders in putting together and campaigning for all over the city. It makes historic increases in funding for arts, music, physical education, and enrichment, tutoring, early childhood education, security, security um, improvements in all of our schools, um, and um, cooling and heating um, throughout, throughout the district. I think those are critical in order for kids to be, able to, to be able to function. I think we need to do a lot more. I think that we do need to be engaged in the community. And, and I'd like to talk, I'd, I have been out in the community. In fact, in campaigning for 3A and 3B, I was in every school in the, every school in the district. I've been in every school in the district now as co-chair of the Mill Levy Oversight Committee to make sure that the money is spent as it's supposed to. I think it's critical that we reach out. Um, and that's one of, one of the areas in which I'd like to see a lot of big improvement. 
Thank you. You both talk, I mean, talking about achievement, you, and you, you just said, you know, they're making strides, but it, the progress is too slow. Uh, my understanding is low-income students in DPS, they've been improving by just about 1 to 2 percent since 2006, and overall, the TCAP improvement in the district is somewhere around 2, 2.5 percent. Why do you think that is? And, and both of you can, t can answer this, but why do you think the district hasn't even been able to meet its own goals when it comes to increasing achievement? Can I go sure. Ahead? Yeah. Uh, sure. So, so I, I, I think the goals that the district has set are aggressive. Um, I think it's important to have aggressive goals because I think it's critical that we improve achievement in the schools. Um, I think that we we need to do more. I think it's very important. I think the early childhood education funding that we did in 3A will have a big impact on that. All the studies show that, um, particularly with low-income kids, early childhood education makes a big difference. I'd like to see. Um, us come as close as we possibly can to find an ed individual education plan for every child. And that's one of the reasons I believe so much in choice in finding a school that works for every child um, and fits their, their needs. I think we need to do more of that. I think we need to look hard at what's, what's, um, what has been successful in some of the schools that have had better achievement growth and replicate it in the schools um, where the achievement growth hasn't been as good. Um, and I think we need to be willing to discard those things that aren't working. He said choice twice. That's a buzzword, I understand. It Wh is. What do you think about, about, about his view and about achievement generally uh, and why it's been so slow? Well, I think we have uh, only seen the achievement um, gap narrow about 8 to 9 percent over the last 7 to 8 years. And I think that the factors that, that uh, impact the achievement gap include both socioeconomic factors and other factors that um, if kids have uh, an engaged kind of curriculum, if they have good role models and experienced teachers that can get them excited about learning, and that if kids see uh, role models that can help them, um, if we see the diversity in our staff that we have in our schools, that it could really help in increase uh, our child's likelihood to become engaged in their education and, and be motivated to be uh, become more um, involved with their teachers and to also become uh, to to increase their interest in the schools and in their in education. How does the board increase the community's involvement? I mean, when you're, if you're elected to the school board, what do you do to get parents and other members of the community really engaged? I think that parents um, too often have been engaged in uh, problems with our schools too late. We don't have early and often engagement. Our, <coughs> our families at times um, find it hard to access the district and I'd like to see as a result, I'd like to see a quarterly basis that we go out into the district, into different areas of the district. So if we have issues that come up within that uh, area, that the school board is more accessible to the people in our community. At this point, um, it, it's going to be very difficult, I think, for our community to get down to the uh, administration building as easily as it might be for the school board to go out into the community. Um, so I'll let you respond. Mike, do you agree? Respond. Do you like that idea? Um, I like that idea, but I think that the, the, the first job for, for community outreach is the elected school board members. I think that's our role, particularly those of us who, as in District 3, will be elected from, um, from a geographical area. I think it's our obligation to reach out to the community. I think it's our obligation to go to PTA meetings. As I said, I've been to all the PTAs in the district. Um, a lot of the, the PTAs were surprised to see someone there talking about the schools from, um, from that perspective. I think it's important that we reach out to the community. I think it's important that, uh, that board members go to the schools, meet with the community. I think it's important that we have community events in the, in the schools um, to draw people in. Um, I'd love to see the school board do it in, in whole also, but I think the primary responsibility is with the school board members. I think that some of the issues that we've had in our neighborhoods could have been taken care of way ahead of time if school board members would have gone out and knocked on doors and talked to the community and anticipated issues. One example that's of that. critical. What are you talking one, about? One example of that, for example, in our neighborhood is um, 
the Whiteman School that's near Lowry um, was a closed down school and they placed a, a Denver language school um, in the school which drew children from all over the city and didn't really think about what it was going to do for the traffic in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and there have been a lot of complaints in the community about that. I think that's something that the school board member in that area should have been thinking about, should have been looking ahead um, to and should have been out in the community talking to the neighbors and working with city council people. Um, I think it's, it's gotten a lot better, they've done a lot of improvements, but it's a lot easier to avoid a problem than to try to solve it after it's already there. In terms of vision, long term for this district, you're not going to be on this board forever, but if you're there, what, what, what kind of vision do you have for the district, you know, say 10 years out, 10 years from now, just real quick, 30 seconds or so. I'd like to see every child who graduates from Denver Public Schools ready to go to college without remediation, ready to go into a career and be ready to perform at 100%, ready to go to the military. Um, I think that that's our ultimate goal, to graduate students who are prepared to go out into the world. I think that we need to raise our expectations. We need to raise our standards. We need to make sure that every child that finishes a DPS education that graduates is ready for the workforce. Megan, in 30 seconds or a minute, your long-term vision for the next decade. I think that college and career readiness are extremely important for our kids, but I also think there are other elements that are important for a child's success in life. I think that uh, some of the issues which I brought up earlier around widening our curriculum, including those areas of art, music, library, language, and civics. I think that uh, our social <coughs> studies curriculum could include civics, economics, and that some of the things our children need to succeed in life are not found in our narrow curriculum of math, reading, writing, and science. I think those are extremely important uh, core values and, and core curriculum, but I think that there is so much more in keeping our students engaged in school so that they will graduate and that they will have developed skills that take them far in their life beyond college and career. I want to ask you a couple of individual questions now, so you're not both going to answer this, but you can engage each other afterwards. And Meg, we'll start with you. These questions are about the district and, and school finance. Um, give you about two minutes to okay. respond to this one, but the first question is just about the recent uh, bond and mill levy. Did you support that, and why or why not? Okay. I supported the mill levy. That was 3A. I thought that it was extremely valuable and continue to believe that early childhood education and uh, the tutoring programs and arts and music, which our mill levies have brought to our district in both this last one in 2012 and 2008, have been very important to our district. I did not vote for 3A. I was concerned about uh, the accountability and the oversight of this bond. I felt that it was ill-conceived and pushed through very quickly. And um, primarily my concern was it didn't really have community engagement or representation from all community members. It was uh, a situation where I felt the community needed to have a more informed uh, decision-making process and for that reason I did not support 3A and my suspicions unfortunately were um, were founded when one of the first purchases with the bonds was a building at 1860 Lincoln to house our DPS administration. I don't believe and I'm, I, I don't think that voters would be happy to know that we did not know that would be on our bond when we voted for it. So, no, I did not. But I think that the mill levy has brought some great things to our school district. Mike, give you about a minute er, uh, to respond uh, on the subject of the, the mill levy and the bond. Okay. I was a big proponent of the mill levy and the bond. I was the co-chair of the committee that put together the, put the, together the mill levy, um, and I was on the committee that put together the bond. We did an incredible job reaching out to the community. And we did an incredible job putting projects in there that benefit the entire community. I spent a whole year of my life working on this, campaigning for it, at the same time um, spending, the, spending the money on all the things that Mega said she's in favor of, which is arts, music, um, physical education, enrichment. And she's also touted the fact that we were able to open the Byers Building as a new DSST, which wouldn't have happened if 3B had not passed. I spent my entire 2012 fighting for this. Meg was the largest, was the third largest contributor against the bond and against the mill levy, 
And while I was out campaigning for it, she was working with the people who were opposing it, trying to get it stopped. I think that's an issue. I wonder how you can run for the school board after having opposed all that additional funding that made such a big difference. The boiler in George Washington, where kids were going to school in, in ski jackets and mittens, um, the Byers building never would have been converted to a DSST. There were security devices in all the schools across the district. Um, there were, uh, the kids were passing out because of the heat in the schools, and we did cooling, cooling solutions in, in all the schools throughout the district. I think they were critical. I think it made an incredible amount of difference um, to our district, and in the long run, is really going to make a difference to, to um, the education our kids get. Any response, Meg? Well, um, it, it's to me, uh, I, what I should disclose to you is that I donated about $200 to the 3A. So it was not a huge amount, and we were a very grassroots group that was trying to point out to the voters that they needed to be more informed. In our district, some schools did not get any attention that needed that attention. And um, <clears throat> we were busy building new schools before we took care of some of the infrastructure problems. George Washington is a good example. However, we had a, uh, a couple of weeks at the end of this summer that were very, very hot in our schools. So I'm not sure that our heating and cooling solutions were thorough enough. I do believe that it's important for us to look at the schools that have these existing structural problems and put our money there first before we start building new schools. I think it's important for our kids to have advocates who want to be good stewards of our taxpayer money. And I did not feel that the bond, this bond in particular, would do that. I have supported every bond my entire life as a voter. If I felt it was a good bond, I would certainly support it. And I would like to see a new bond where the oversight and the community involvement is less weighted towards some of the people who have uh, interest in bonds. Can I, yep. say, can I follow up on that? Because part, part, of, the, part of the bond um, resolution that the, school board, that the school board adopted created two oversight committees for both the bond and the mill levy that were staffed, that, that are filled with people appointed by the, appointed by the school board. Um, I happen to be co-chair of the mill levy oversight committee, and I can tell you we've had six or seven meetings already diligently working our way through the expenditures um, of the mill levy. I've been around to visit every school in the district to make sure the money's being spent as intended. We're committed to, to publishing um, twice a year reports. We thought about that. We talked about it. We made it part of the resolution. Uh, we made it part of the commitment. I think that that was thought through extremely well. Um, and I, I don't think there's probably been a bond done like this or a, or a mill levy done like this any place in the country with, the, with this much oversight. We, we can come back to this in a second. Mike, I want to ask you about this, the budget overall. What's the overall budget for, for DPS for next year? It's a little over $3 billion. $3 billion? Okay, um, $811 million is what I have in general fund dollars. You're looking at more than just the general fund. Yes, I take it when yes, you answer yes. that. Um, in terms of the board, the, the money that the board controls and, and the decisions that you'll make as a member of the board if you're elected, how do you do a better job of, with the budget, in sort of redirecting, reallocating some of those funding to meet the goals that you've outlined? One, one, of the, one of the things that I want to do with the money is to make sure that it actually follows the children into the classroom. So I'm extremely committed to making sure that we take the minimum amount for central administration and make sure that the money goes directly to the schools and that there's control in the schools with the teachers and the parents and the principals in those schools to spend the money as they believe it's right for the kids in those schools. I don't think there's any one-size-fits-all that you can determine at a, at a district level on what every school needs. I want to see the money pushed out into the community. I want to see a minimal amount of oversight. I'd like to see choices in the schools on how many services they take from the central administration and how many they perform on their own. I think the, the way to solve the issues to get the most bang for the buck is to move the money down to the people who are actually benefiting from it and spending it on a day-to-day -day basis. Does the, the money that goes to schools, does that need to be uh, tied to achievement? To, to, I mean? I think that we should, I think that we need to encourage achievement. And I, I think that where we have, certainly the money needs to go to help kids with special needs. And, and um, 
I'm, I'm certainly in favor of making sure that the resources are allocated to where the need is. Um, but I wouldn't punish a school because they have more special needs kids or because their achievement isn't as good. I think what's important is to encourage schools to grow wherever they start, whether they start at 35% proficiency or 95% proficiency. I want the money to go to encourage them to increase by 5% or 10% or 20% over, over the course of years. Meg, any response on this one? Well, I think that some of the schools where you find the lowest achievement are some of the schools that need the most resources. And that doesn't include just bricks and mortar. It includes having uh, qualified teachers and having teachers that are going to help our students achieve. Um, I would like to respond a little bit more to the oversight of the bond and the decision that I made and, and why I think it was important for us to have a uh, conversation and differences expressed between each other when the bond came up. Um, from what I know, there needed to be far more community members on the Oversight Committee. If we truly want community engagement, we need to make sure that we also have those members of the community on some of these, these committees that are making decisions about uh, how the bond will be spent. And I don't believe that that has happened. I also <clears throat> um, am watching the school board over the last year and a half while I've been contemplating running. Um, I have seen uh, I've seen the oversight committee process not include the committee, uh, the community, and I, I know I had applied for one of those positions, and I've, I've stayed in touch with many of the people on the committee who aren't as convinced that this is a, an authentic oversight process. So I would like to see us make sure that that happens with this bond, and that um, in future we also create bonds and structure bonds where the community is involved in creating what the priorities will be with the bond money which we are requesting from our community and our taxpayers. Okay, I appreciate it. We've spent a little extra time on this, but I know this is an important issue and I know there's some daylight between the two of you on this, so um, I appreciate the, the thorough responses on that. I have a quick question for both of you and it's a yes-no question. Um, Amendment 66, the tax hike, billion dollars for schools, got through the legislature, the new School Finance Act. Are you supporting that this fall, yes or no? Yes. You? Yes, I am. Okay, that was easy. Uh, let's move to uh, <laughs> let's move to a couple Seriously. questions about accountability. Um, uh, the legislature a couple years ago passed Senate Bill 191, uh, obviously widely debated, uh, tying teacher evaluation and pay uh, to teacher performance, uh, not just giving tenure based on experience. I spent a long time covering that at the Capitol. It was uh, piloted last year. It goes into effect this year. Do you support SB 191, um, and why? I think it's very important for us to be um, making sure we have good teachers in our classrooms. In my experience as a parent for the last 15 years, I've had a couple of students who have had poor teachers. And it's very difficult to, uh, to move teachers out um, without being disruptive to a school. I think that it's important for us to uh, evaluate teachers based on how they are able to manage a classroom their educational pedagogy, their experience as a teacher. At this point, we are evaluating teachers based on uh, achievement tests that the teachers cannot control the factors for. We have students who may not have eaten, may not have slept, may have a very unstable household where they are called upon to be the <coughs> parent in the household while another parent is at work. And I think that for us to expect those students to be able to let alone go into the classroom ready to learn and then take a, a student achievement test is uh, something that it's very difficult for our teachers to, uh, to have any control over. And I think that how a teacher is doing in their classroom and how other assessments are uh, benefiting our children as far as looking where we need to go with their uh, educational needs is, is a better way of helping our teachers than to be using assessment, the high stakes testing as an assessment tool for our teachers. So to the question of do you support, it sounds like a not so much from you. Mike, uh, you do support, did support SB 191 and, and I imagine still do, correct? 
Yes, but let me just explain that um, Denver has its own version of SB 191. It's called the, the LEAP system, mm -hmm. and I'm very proud of what we've what, what uh, the district has been able to do in cooperation with teachers in Denver. Um, we've developed a system that has buy-in from teachers, has support from teachers. It's, it's very fair. Um, it does, a, it does a, a, a number of things. First of all, I think that absolutely the most important um, factor in a kid's education is having a high quality teacher in front of the room. I think there's no doubt about that. I think we need to do everything we can to make sure that's the case and I think teachers do an incredible job. Um, what Senate Bill, uh, what, what the LEAP system does is a couple of things. First of all, it evaluates teachers based on outside peer, ed peer evaluators who are not the principal. They're people who've had some teaching experience and they're objective in their evaluations and they do it across the district. I think that's a win-win for teachers. I think that's a win-win for the district. I think that teachers get better evaluations. I think we learn better information. I think it's more fair. There is also a portion of the LEAP system that's based on, um, based on um, performance of, this, of the students, but it's based on growth in performance. It's not based on gross numbers of, on, on tests. It's based on how those children learn over the year, and it's not completely based on, on the TCAP test. There are a number of uh, variables in there, and I think it's very important that you do that. I think it's critical that if we're going to be delivering education that we have a way to measure whether or not it's, it's working. I think, I think that the LEAP system is a very positive system. I think the most important part of it, though, is that it's going to allow us to, to help those teachers who aren't doing as well as they could. And the critical part of it is the support we're going to be able to, bring, to give those teachers in order to bring them up and make them as good as the teachers who are doing an excellent job. I don't think it's a system that should be used to remove teachers. I think the primary, the primary role of that is to identify what's working in the classroom, what people need help on, and getting help to the teachers who need the help so that all of the teaching is at the very, very top quality, and so our children are improving at the faster rate that we talked about earlier. Yeah, real quick. Well, I think it's important when we're evaluating teachers to look at the leadership in the school. And I, I agree with Mike. I think the peer evaluation portion of the LEAP um, process is good. I, I do think, however, oftentimes we have peer evaluators who don't have enough classroom experience. And we certainly have some principals who do not have as much classroom experience as the teachers whom they are evaluating. I think that the principal can be a very strong force in being a consultant, a coach, a collaborator, and that that's part of the evaluation process, but should not be, uh, we should not be requiring or basing 50% of a teacher's um, evaluation on student achievement and factors that cannot be controlled by the teacher. I do think that it's important for us to have evaluation tools and that we support our teachers we allow them an opportunity to show improvements when they have uh, a coach or a principal come in and, and point out areas where they do need improvement. Sometimes uh, personal uh, relations can get in the way of fair and accurate evaluations, personality differences. And I, I think that it's important for us before we make decisions about a teacher's future if we find they are not uh, adequately teaching our children that we give them an opportunity to show improvement and at that point that's where I think a principal and a peer evaluator can help in addition to having some master teachers in every school that are helping our new teachers that don't have quite as much as experience. From what you've seen from the, the implementation of piloting of 191 last year it seems like most of the teachers have been rated effective. You noticed any issues with the the pilot, the, the first year, the testing of this evaluation system? I think the pilot was critical because it, I, I think doing a, doing a dry run and getting feedback and finding out what works and what doesn't work is, is, is critical. I think, that it's, I think it's always going to be a work in progress. And, it can, and, and we can always look at anything that we're trying to do to improve the schools and say the glass is half empty. I think the glass is half full. I think that there are some, I think that we've got people in our schools, we've got teachers, we've got administrators who are trying desperately to increase the, the achievement of our, of our kids. And I think we ought to, 
instead of just criticizing what they're doing, we need to come up with alternatives. So what would you do differently if you don't like Senate Bill 191, if you don't like the LEAP system? I think it's a good system. I think it can always be better. Um, but I think, we're, I think we're really moving in the right direction. And I think we've got buy-in by all the parties on it. I want to move to a specific question about a District 3 school. We've already, uh, one of you has mentioned, I think you mentioned it earlier, the new DSST Byers Middle School that opened uh, this year. Uh, probably drove some students um, from neighboring district managed schools to that school. Is that good or is that bad? To, to have a new school and it's, it's the hot new school and everybody wants to go there. Is, I mean, is it a zero sum game? I don't, th I don't think it's a zero sum game at all. I, I think when, you know, when my youngest, when my oldest daughter, who's now 20 years old, started school in Denver Public Schools in 1998, there were less than 60,000 students in Denver Public Schools. Today there are 85,000. I think that by bringing in options and choices and giving, giving parents an opportunity to find, find schools that really work for their kids, we've made incredible progress in bringing people back to, uh, back, back to this district. I think the more we do that, we have the lowest capture rate in, in District 3 of any district in the um, city and we have about 50 percent of the students in our schools who actually choice out of their uh, cho choice out of their boundary schools into choice schools and one of the reasons um, that works is because they have alternatives for their kids and it's bringing people back to the district we're bringing kids back from the um, from the private schools and from other districts I think it can only be positive to give kids the opportunity to go to a school that fits their particular needs Meg what have you noticed what do you think about this I, circumstance. You know, I obviously support choice. I have a son who goes to the Denver Green School, which is an innovation school, and a daughter who goes to the Denver School of the Arts, which is a magnet school. I have a 26-year-old daughter who graduated from the Denver School of the Arts in 2005. So I support alternative options for our children. However, I don't support the um, the possibility of our neighborhood schools being starved as a result of it. I am very proud as a District 3 resident that we have the, uh, the uh, School of Science and Technology. It was community driven. It was a school that I attended as a junior high school student actually when it was Byers Junior High School and it was sitting vacant. The community wanted to have a alternative school there that focused on science and technology. That's been a a uh, design that has been replicable in our district and has been successful. I think it's very important though when we're talking about school choice that one of the first options and most viable options should be a school that every student can walk to in their community and where community is built around that school. Uh, the Denver Green School is a wonderful example. I live four houses away from there. My son can walk there and it has brought the community in. We have an acre garden. Our community has a community share farming program and we watch our students develop math, reading, writing, science skills through the project-based curriculum that we have at the Denver Green School. It was community driven. They came to our homeowners association, they came to our neighborhood, and they talked to us about what kind of design we would have there and whether this was something that would work. It was developed by uh, teachers and it was something that um, was community driven. Again, this is a very important thing to make sure schools succeed by bringing in the community to help make some of the important decisions in the planning stages and from the ground up. I want to ask you quickly about you know what what you do when you're a board member and you see a school in a neighborhood for whatever reason starting to lose enrollment. You see enrollment drop. Um, we've seen a couple you know very high profile school closures here in Denver in the last decade or so. Um, how do you prevent that? How do you shore up a school that st you know people smell blood in the water and they start to say I don't, I don't want my kid going to that school and the next thing you know you've got a problem. What, what does a board member do to to avoid that situation? Well, I, I'll give you a good example, and that is <clears throat> my, my neighborhood uh, high school, George Washington High School, has been through um, a great deal of turmoil. We've brought in a new principal, and I'm hopeful that that's going to be a good situation where that principal goes out into the community and works with both our neighborhood school, the Denver Green School, 
other middle schools that were within the community to try and make sure that we, we support our neighborhood schools. And as I said earlier, that it be one of those uh, options that is viable and just as viable as the other innovation schools and, and non-traditional designs that we have. Um, I want to bring in Mike because we okay. do need to move, but I, sure. I, I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but sure. But I, what do you do when you're... Yeah, I don't think there's a one size fit all, fits all. I think what you need to do is talk to the parents and the, and the community in that school. You need to talk to the kids in that school. You need to talk to the administrators in that school and find out what they need, and we need to try to provide it um, as a district. I'd like to see us, as I said earlier, give all the local schools more autonomy so they can develop a program that really works for their neighborhood to bring in the kids. And I think if we got rid of some of the top-down rules, rigid top-down rules and centralized bureaucracy that controls what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in the schools, that would make a big difference. I'd like to see more innovation schools. Um, I like the fact that the Green School is an innovation school, but Meg, I'd like to remind you that your largest your largest supporter filed a lawsuit that would remove the innovation status from the Denver Green School as a startup because it was a startup innovation school. I don't know. I, I don't know what you think about that. If that well, if that lawsuit get, succeeds, I would need to get more will, information about innovation. what you're you're alluding to. But what I would like to also um, state that I, I was trying to make a point about George Washington is you know our our school is being starved. Um, one of the results of the bond is that there is a new high school being built that is that is within the same distance to Northfield and Stapleton as Stapleton is to George Washington. As a result, when we have some of these traditional schools, oftentimes uh, charter schools, innovation schools might be able to uh, be more selective in the students that they bring in, be more selective in the students that they retain and keep in the program from the beginning to the end of their career in that school. And I think it's extremely important that we not um, push neighborhood schools out of the option of being a viable choice in, in our district. And that when we are giving uh, innovation schools and charter schools some, uh, some latitudes that we don't give our traditional schools, well, that's not a fair playing field. And I think that uh, I've seen in the time that I've been in the district as a parent, there's been a proliferation of that. And I think we need to bring more of a balance between traditional neighborhood schools that a child can walk to that is accessible to all kids, not just kids who have parents that can access the choice process, but that we also have those options be as important as our uh, non-traditional options. Let me just, I, can I, I just jump in there on the neighborhood schools? I just want to sure. make it clear that I'm a big proponent of neighborhood schools. My children have gone to two neighborhood schools and, and two magnet schools. I think neighborhood schools are fantastic. I think we need to support them. We need to make sure that they have exactly the same support as the other schools have. Um, and uh, I don't think there's any distance between, a, between us on that. What I'd like to see in the neighborhood schools is I think I agree with you too. I'd like to see the neighborhood schools have the same kind of flexibility in, in organizing their day and organizing the way they run their school as some of the innovation and some of the charter schools do. If we did that, we would actually make the schools all across the city all on the cutting edge. I'm completely in favor of that. Uh, just a quick question what? about choice, and I know you have a little bit of divergence on that uh, subject, but you know, when a kid's ability to get into a various school, a top boundary school is sort of determined by this SPF, right, the school performance framework, that's largely the function of how well off their parents are, am I right? I mean, that's like, where do you live? You're within this boundary, you can go to a better school. There are a lot of people who think that's not fair. If you're a board member, what do you do about that? The, these boundaries are pretty rigid. How do you address that problem? We, we don't have a ton of time for this, so just you know, in, in a minute or a minute and a half, just give me your thoughts on that. Well, I think an SPF rating is it, it, it's pretty much like a report card on the schools. And I think that uh, it is a good way for us to help parents understand what schools are available. I think it needs a lot of tweaking. I think that there are some factors and weights that, um, that are not uh, necessarily helpful in us making sure that our communities have great schools. I'll give you an example. That's Ashley Elementary. And that school uh, has just grown from going to red 
they've bypassed orange and they are now at yellow. They are approaching green. They have been a school that was identified um, not, not necessarily as a turnaround school, but they, they had the district come in without the community's involvement and support to try and redesign this school. We had a very effective principal. We had wonderful community support. And uh, the parents were happy with it, but um, the parents weren't involved in the decisions to change the design. Unfortunately, our third year at Ashley, they have shown this support. But by the time um, that those improvements were showing within the third year, we got rid of the principal and many of the teachers and the students are, are very disrupted now because of this process. So I, I think we need to just tweak and fine tune the SPF rating, but it, it not be the end all and be all in determining what is really a good school for our kids. Mike, your thoughts? Yeah, one of the things on the SPF that it, it doesn't measure very well, which would be one of my priorities on the school board, is it really doesn't measure um, art, music, um, physical education enrichment. I think we need we need to modify it to make sure that it takes those into account and and weights those. And as I said, I spent big part of 2012 making sure we had more funding um, for those. I think that I think the crux of your question though was what do you do um, what do you do uh, about boundaries? And um, I think that some of the exciting things that we've been able to do around the city with some of the choice choice schools. Is to is to have some preferences in boundaries um, for um, for kids for kids who are struggling. I think that schools do better if they have a good mixture of of kids of different socioeconomic level, of different ra um, racial backgrounds, different backgrounds of every kind. I'd like to see us as a school board sit down and have a serious question about how we can make DPS schools really diverse across across the board. Okay, we're in the home stretch, so you guys are both doing great. Um, you guys both filled out an A plus Denver candidate survey and answered a lot of questions. Can I give you a specific question based on your survey responses? I'd like the response to just be about a minute or so, if you can. And Mike, we'll start with you. Uh, you seem to support the current plans that DPS has, the current direction of the board, <coughs> strategies for improving the district. Uh, what would you do to ensure the things, that the strategies that are being implemented? work better in terms of raising achievement faster. We did talk at the outset about the achievement increases and them being a little bit slower than you'd like. Again, what do, what do you do? What, just give me a few things in a minute or so. Okay, well I think I think there are positives about what DPS has been doing. I, I don't think I overstated that in my questionnaire though. I think we're, we're headed generally in the right direction, but I don't think we're moving nearly fast enough, and I don't think we're moving fast enough in improving achievement, giving diverse curriculum in all kinds of ways. Um, I think we, we, we really need to look closely at what's been working in, um, in raising achievement in, in some of the schools that have had um, achievement growth, longer school days, longer school years in some of the schools, um, more flexibility in scheduling. Um, I think there are some real opportunities. I'd like to see a lot more, but I don't think there's, again, a one size fits all. I keep coming back to this idea that every school is different, every, every child is different, and we need to allow schools to, to try different things, see what works for the kids in those neighborhoods, for the kids who are attracted to that school. And if they work, we keep doing them and we add to them. If they don't work, we discard them and try something else. Thank you. Meg, uh, you said in this survey that you're committed to making sure every neighborhood has a great school. How would you do that if you're on the board? Well, I think one of the, um, one of the common themes that you've heard from me tonight is involving the community and helping design what their school should look like and what we can do as a community to help strengthen our neighborhood schools. I, I believe that it's important for our schools and some of the schools that are struggling to have quality teachers in their schools and that uh, that will help reassure that our neighborhood schools are strong. Okay, we have a few uh, questions here. We'll try and go a little faster on this and try to get to as many of these as we can. The first one is uh, from somebody who submitted this question online. And they said, the Denver Post reported that DPS plans to spend three quarters of a million dollars to give students cards to swipe when they get on and off mm. school buses. Some t say this program is going to keep kids safe. Others think it's a waste of time. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down on this idea. 
Um, I, I, I need to know more about really the cost benefit, but I think it's a good idea to keep our to keep our kids safe on the buses to be able to track them. I know there's a lot of confusion. My kids have, have ridden the bus for years. There's a lot of confusion of the bus drivers, who's on, who's off. I think it's important in these times that we make our kid that we keep our kids safe. That's one of the reasons I was a big supporter of 3B because we put security devices in all of our schools to make them safer for all the kids. Meg, you like this idea? Swiping cards on the bus? Um, well, I'm thinking of the conversation I had with my daughter when she brought home her bus card. Uh, she was concerned about some privacy issues, and I don't know about the, uh, the swiping in and swiping out, whether, whether um, I need to know more about it, and I need to know how much it's costing the district before I could give you a final answer. But um, we have uh, many problems on our buses. We have many disciplinary problems. We have some other things I think that we maybe need to look at before we start looking at that. I'm not sure what kind of tracking system or what the needs uh, that created that tracking system were that were identified. Um, you've probably both been close observers of the DPS board in recent years. Um, in your view, what are some of the best decisions the board has made and what are some of the worst? Maybe give me one of each. Do you want to start? You know, I think that the board, especially in the last year and a half, has worked very well together and come to unanimous decisions around both the modified consent decree, which I ensures that our English language learners will receive quality uh, teaching and that we will receive uh, experienced, certified ELL English language learners or English language acquisition teaching, that the kids in our schools who are English language learners have qualified teachers, not on-track teachers that are on the job training, but that they have teachers that are certified in that. Currently in our district, or in the state, um, it's not required of teacher certification. I'd like to see us move more towards that because we have an expanding number of English language learners and we need to be responding to that. It was a court order that we need to be following and it's the right thing for us to be doing. The good and bad of the, of the board, the recent decisions, you have a positive and a negative for me? Well, I, I think 3A and 3B were, were, were ground shaking. Um, they, um, 3A is the largest single um, year to year, $49 million a year of additional funding for DPS for a whole series of things that are gonna make an incredible difference in our, in our kids' life for art, for tutoring, um, for early childhood <coughs> education, for community engagement. I think, I think that was, incredibly important. I also think 3B, which is the largest bond that's ever been passed in this state, was incredibly important. It does many, many things that make such a difference to kids, keeps them safe, keeps them warm in the wintertime, keeps them cool in, in the hot months, and it allows us to expand the capacity where, 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 people, where, people are, um, where, where kids are coming in. It allows us to get bigger. I think that was monumental. I think that if you're going to be a pro DPS person, you need to provide the funding to allow DPS to do its job. I think some of the things that were unfortunate were, I think the process around um, the co-location at North High was handled very poorly. I think that the community engagement process that the district has done generally has been bad. One of the reasons I wanna be on the board is because I, as a school board member, will take responsibility for reaching out in my community and making sure that we get ahead of issues before they, before they explode at the board level. I think that that's a job that all the school board members need to take extremely seriously. You mentioned some of those unanimous decisions and how well the board works together, together and, and forgive members of the media if we just notice the four, three splits and the, the sort of uh, bright divide, you know, the, the dividing line between the reform side and the union side. I mean, it seems like there are uh, pretty stark, there's a, there's a separation there. Um, has the polarization on the board, have you noticed that? Have you felt that? And do you think that's something that should be addressed? Or is that just overstated and, and overplayed in the media? Uh, go ahead. Well, let me, let me come back to 3A and 3B, because it was a 5-2 decision. It wasn't a 4-3 decision. I think that was critically important. And it had the full support of the, of the, of the, of the teachers' union um, for, for everything that was in it. So I think that some of those concerns about 4-3 split are really, really overdone. I think most of what we see isn't so much the voting pattern, it's the behavior pattern in board meetings, which I, which I think is an embarrassment. I think that there are some, 
There are some um, personalities on the board who are focused primarily on personalities, uh, pr primarily on adult po political issues and not on the kids. I think it's critically important that this next board get beyond that and act like the, the stewards for the children in this district that we should be. And all of our conversations should be what is going to improve education for kids in Denver, not about adult politics. Has the board, I mean, is the board dominated by personalities like he says, or is that not fair? I think uh, when you have a process where all board members get accurate, timely, and consistent information, it makes it easier for those board members to come to decisions more easily. I think it's important that when you're making decisions, that are going to impact our children. And our children rely on the adults to make the decisions that they may not know enough about making. So I think it's important for adults to engage in sometimes even lively conversations. Good decisions are not made in a vacuum. And it's important for the board to understand the process uh, of what has happened over the last year, several years where I think that when you don't get accurate information from the administration, it can set the board up for having uh, interactions in front of the media, in front of the public, and that we do have a process that we should follow where the board gets information early enough that they can digest it, that they can analyze it, that they can talk to each other outside of the public venue to make decisions, like in a work session, and that if we got information early enough and all board members got the same information, it would make the decision-making process perhaps more peaceful. However, I think it's important for the board to also have differences of opinion, to come to the, the table and to be able to work together and finding out what our common values are, because I think that we all want to do what's best for our kids. We have different ways of going about it, and that we have a district and administration that I think has created a much greater divide than needed to happen. So you fault the people upstairs at DPS? I think that has a great deal to do with it, yes. Okay. Um, you guys have both given very thorough answers, and I appreciate uh, Thank all you. the views expressed tonight. We're kind of at that point where we're all wrapped up. It's time for closing statements. You've each got two minutes, approximately. We're not going to be sticklers about the time, but two minutes to tell Denver voters why you or you are the better choice to represent District 3 on the next board, and we flipped the coin earlier, and so Meg opted to go last, so Mike, we'll start with you. Um, thank you, Eli. I, I, I am running for this seat on the Denver School Board because I think that our kids are the most important thing we do on this planet, um, raising them and educating them. Um, I think that every child should have access to a great school in their neighborhood and they should all and their parents should have access to a school someplace in the city that serves the needs of their of their child whether it's in their neighborhood or elsewhere I'd like to see those um, schools located as close as possible to the kids I I really believe that the way to make our schools better in the long run is to push the decision making down to the school level, to the parents, to the teachers, to the principal in the school, to the community in the school, because they really know what works for the kids in that school. I am completely committed to making sure that all kids have access to every, ac every, every type of academic um, opportunity, AP classes, um, any kind, any kind of uh, rigorous any kind of rigorous education. I also believe in a completely well-rounded curriculum, and I fought extremely hard for it. I spent the last, I spent most of 2012 fighting to make sure we had funding for arts, music, physical education, and enrichment all over the city. I think it's critical. I think that um, everything we do in our schools is absolutely critical. I think it's important, though, that the that the viewing audience tonight think about. Um, about this election as, as a real choice. I mean, there's a real choice here. Meg, Meg and I have some real differences on issues that relate to, to Denver Public Schools. I am a very big advocate of um, giving kids access to a school that works for them. Um, I'm a big advocate of funding our schools um, completely and worked very hard on 3A and 3B. 
I am completely committed to making sure that every Denver child graduates from high school ready to go into the career or workforce. I think that's our obligation. I think that that's what I will do on your school board, and I hope to, hope to earn your vote in November. Thank you. Mike Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you. Meg Shum, your closing statement, if you will. Thank you very much, and thanks, Mike, for agreeing to meet tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about some of the issues that I believe are important. I think that uh, community engagement is the one thread that will help develop uh, a quality school system where our families, our school community is involved in the decisions and that we not only that we be allowed to set the table, eat the meal, and not just be asked to clean up and pay for the bill. And I also support us bringing um, good quality, broadened curriculum into our classrooms. Art, music, physical education, library, languages, and civics included in our social studies curriculum. I think that these cannot be relegated to enrichment or after school classes. I think that we need to have qualified, certified individuals, teachers who are helping our, our students in these areas and that we have spent an enormous amount of time developing high stakes testing and that instead of us having that as a priority, we look at other assessments that, that help us understand really the whole child and that we help develop children so that they're ready to learn and be college ready, <coughs> career ready, and life ready. I also think it's important for us to emphasize neighborhood schools where a child can walk to those schools. I clearly, Mike, support choice and, and non-traditional programs because both of my children are in a magnet school and innovation school. And in being involved in those schools, I also know how important it is to uh, look at accountability and transparency when we're looking at asking the voters to give us money. I think neighborhood schools help create a safer and a more secure neighborhood. I think that they help us increase our home values. But primarily, my, my important goal is to see our kids, my kids, your kids, everybody's kids get access to a quality school that they can walk to and that that be our first option. I also think that uh, it is important that we have our kids get from one grade level to the next grade level and be ready to enter into new grade level. So I'd like to see us look at assessments and to allow our teachers and to trust our teachers more than we do at this point to help us determine whether our children are ready to move on to the next grade and into a great future as graduates of the Denver Public Schools. All right. Do you want to check with our judges and find out who won? Yeah, yes, please. Yes. Just kidding. Um, do you want to arm wrestle? <laughs> no, but I'll shake his hand. Shake his hand. He, Thank you, Meg. He's a great parent at DSA, and, and I've enjoyed working with him. We do have some common ground, but we have some differences on the way to get to it. So thank well, you very much for helping the community understand those things. No, we appreciate it. It's important. Thank it's important you. to have, have you guys in. And, and thank you uh, very much. To you know, put some attention on this race, and I know it's not a, a race that everybody in the city is fixated on. School board politics are, uh, you know, it's, it's a select few that really get involved and that really care, and those are... Uh, important. It should be more people that pay attention and that are informed about this. So we hope that uh, tonight's discussion was illuminating and informative and helpful to our audience uh, watching online and on Channel 22. Thank you to all of you who did watch tonight. The first of the 2013 DPS school board debates presented, of course, by A Plus Denver. We're going to host a debate for the remaining three races as well. The at-large uh, seat, the debate with those candidates, Michael Kiley, Joan Poston, and Barbara O'Brien. That'll be here next week on Thursday, September 26th. The District 2 debate, that's Southwest Denver. That will be Wednesday, October 2nd. And the final of our four debates for Northeast Denver for that seat, that'll be Wednesday, October 9th. All the debates like this one will start at 7 p.m. And they will air live right here on DPS TV, Channel 22. And they'll also stream live as well on the web at, I'll read this website so you get it, dpsk12.org slash channel 22. If you have questions you'd like to ask the candidates, you can go to the A-plus Denver website, aplusdenver.org, or use hashtag DPSDebates on Facebook or Twitter. Thank you again for watching tonight, and remember, go to the polls on November 5th. Good night. Good.